Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode 181 of Circle Up and Get Real, where by now you know we talk about things that matter with people who matter. And today I am excited to have a conversation with Tom Kading, who I met, man, it's been a few years, Tom, we've known each other. In applies. I know it, it does. Like five years ago or so. You know, oh my gosh, really? Four or five years, maybe four years ago. I suppose it has been. You know, we we first both were members of an organization here in Fargo, and then we ended up kind of co-officing <laughs> in a, in 2021 and uh, just kind of circled each other's orbit for a long time. But, you know, Tom, I, I know that the way the world works is people gravitate toward like-minded and like-hearted people. And that's kind of what I've always sensed from you absolutely no i i've enjoyed getting to know you jody and you know at bng you know at different different opportunities it's kind of been fun to hear your perspective so it's it's been fun yeah thanks that's well because i do have a different perspective so before we get too far i want to tell you who tom is tom is an attorney and it's your own firm right tom yes Fargo Patent and business law it's it's my firm. I started it a couple of years ago, officially in 2019, and now there's eight of us. So wow, that's awesome. So you're an entrepreneur in kind of a traditional business. Yeah, it's it's been a windy path to get into the practice of law, and and I would say Fargo Planning Business Law. We're a little bit non-traditional how the firm runs. Now, I don't think many firms run like we run. Um, so, so I, you know, I don't have the background of being working in big law for six years or whatever. So I, I just don't have that background. So I didn't bring that background with me when I started Fargo Patent Law. And, you know, I, I think it's a, I'm an entrepreneur in a traditional business, but running it non-traditionally. Ooh, I like that. That should be your tagline. I like that. You know what? I mean, this just reminds me of, I, I was in networking for a long time. And uh, one of my first networking organizations that I joined, one of the people who was in that with me was an attorney who unfortunately has died since then, but he became a very good friend of mine, Brad Swenson. And his tagline was the lawyer who loves. <laughs> that was so like non-traditional for him to say that, that people remembered it. So when you say that you are an entrepreneur in a traditional field, but not running it traditionally, I think that's pretty exciting. What what makes you different, Tom? So, you know, specifically, you know, I can touch on me individually and in mm-hmm. the business, but the business. So, you know, the one of the unique things about us is we have a business background. You know, many of people at the firm, there's MBAs, there's people who own business, businesses, own businesses, you know, just off the top of my head, there's a lady in the office who owns a, you know, a, a jewelry business. She sells, you know, custom made jewelry and kind of, it's a side, side thing. That's super awesome. There's a guy in our business who owns a, you know, energy consulting um consulting business down in California and he he works through figuring out different devices and seeing if they actually do save energy or don't save energy and so he has that business he's an attorney as well um so he has that business background I have a business background you know I've you know been heavy in real estate to a couple different ventures over the years so I kind of take that background to the mix. A couple other people in the office have MBAs and kind of a bend on business. We have a real great marketing guy on the team who, you know, he just, he's a marketer and he does a great job doing that. So it, we kind of have a unique makeup within the firm. Um, another thing that makes us unique is, you know, I'm not all about, you know, butts in the seats, as they say. You know, mm-hmm. I think, you know, we want to, we want to, produce top quality results for our clients. And, you know, that's ultimately what we need to do. And that doesn't necessarily mean the attorney has to be in the seat from eight to five to make that happen. But rather, we need to kick out a good result. Attorney, your your job is to kick out the good result. If that means you need to, you know, work remote because you have to take care of your dog that day, that's what we do. So it's a very flexible work environment and you need to do something, take care of it, know that these are your objectives, these are your outcomes that are expected, but 
lot of flexibility. We trust you doing what you do. You're doing. You know, it, that reminds me of the, the culture of the organization where we both um, officed for a while. There, there's just something different when an organization embraces a culture that they want their employees or their associates to feel. And the podcast here is about being real. So it's about getting into that space of allowing the people to be who they are. And you said it's not about getting the butts in seats, but it's about having the people be real with what is important to them, it sounds like. Absolutely. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, my vision for my life, you know, I don't want to be tied to my seat at work. You know, if my child has something that I want to go to, I want to be able to go to, go to that. If I want to, you know, go take a take a long weekend because I don't have anything necessarily pressing, I want to be able to do that. And, you know, as a boss, I can do that pretty flexibly. But I think my employees want that too. And, you know, I think that's a great thing to provide for them is that ability to have that flexibility if they're doing a great job they're knocking out their work of course they're gonna they should have that same flexibility that I have uh, so I think you know building that culture is is important I love that you know I'm, I'm thinking a lot recently about um it's not a new book, but um, Good to Great was written in 2000, I think. And I studied that religiously when it first came out. And I didn't always understand some of those concepts back then. And the one that I'm especially thinking of right now is first who, then what. And um, Collins would talk about getting the people on the bus and then no. deciding where the bus is going to go because the right people will make that decision. And back then I was like, why would I get on a bus that I don't know where it's going? But now the way you just said what you said about getting the right people in the mix, I completely understand that because together the right people are going to make your your uh, organization unique, it sounds like. And that's what you're doing. Absolutely. And I think that's so important. I think having that good flexibility, good culture, good place to work, we're going to get the A players, mm -hmm. which I think yeah. is super important. We're going to get the right people. and you know, good to great. We talk about that book a fair amount here, actually. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the difference between being good at something, being a good attorney, and being a great attorney, it's not a huge difference, but the outcome difference mm -hmm. is huge. Yeah. yeah. And, I, you know, I think having the right people in the right seats and getting those eight players is huge. Yeah. Well, it, what I'm learning too, you attract who you are, not what you want which is really interesting. And that's a subtle distinction too, because if I only want something, I will become really good at wanting it instead of actually getting it. And yeah. so when we get that huge or that subtle distinction where I attract who I am, that starts with you as the, I'm not going to boss, you know, as the boss, but that starts with you because you said you want, you want a players and you will attract them when you are an a player. And that's what I love about the conversations you and I've had over the years too, because they aren't little conversations. They're substantial. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's, I think it's, it's so important um, to head that direction. Yeah. Well, and I think the conversations that we have uh, about, life you mentioned your kids and you mentioned having an opportunity to be with your kids or your dog or whatever is important to you all of that is people focused people centric and if we get too caught up on the results or the outcomes that we want for the clients and people we're working for we sort of put the cart before the horse yet i know that's the way business has been over the course of history I'm sensing there's a subtle distinction that reminds me a little bit of the way Southwest Airlines started. And he was an attorney. Okay. Uh, Herb Kelleher started Southwest Airlines as an attorney because he wanted a easier way to get around Texas. And he developed his company based on the employees. He said, employees are always number one. Customers are number two, because yep. if the employees are happy, they will provide great service automatically. And that's what yep. it feels like you're doing. Absolutely. And, you know, employee, we have to have great employees, make them, you know, set up a great culture for employees and kind of, you know, what we kind of say is, you know, if we're not going to work with jerks, 
you know, if you're going to be a jerk and, you know, treat employees are ba bad, eh, you can find another attorney to work with. We don't need to work with you. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, we're not going to put our employees through abuse from clients or just people being mean to them. It's just, it's just not worth it. So it's, you know, I think I absolutely agree. You know, you got to put your employees first and make sure, you know, that they, they have a good experience here and a, in a good time. And it isn't some super stressful thing that they, you know, hate being here. Right. Well, it sounds a little woo woo. I know I'm a little woo woo, but the law of attraction uh, came into my awareness in 2006, and that's a long time ago now. That whole process that you attract employees and customers and clients instead of going out and trying to snag them or trick them, or, you know, that it's just it's a trust thing. I be who I be and I will attract the forces I wish to use in the cooperation of other people in order to achieve an outcome that's beneficial to everyone. That's not rocket science. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree. You know, I think our, the firm, we we're pretty honest with people. We're pretty straightforward with people. And I think our customers appreciate that. And sometimes that's why our customers actually come to us is mm. because you know, we're honest with you. We're not going to trick you. We're not going to put you through some high pressure sales thing and, you know, get you locked in for a five-year contract or, you know, trick you into anything. And I think as a result, we've have pretty similar, you know, customers to that philosophy. You know, we don't have customers trying to scam the system or be patent trolls or, you know, all these different things. And, you know, I think different lawyers attract different types of clients and we don't happen to attract those types of clients. Uh, that's, that's so good. I'm looking at your list of what you do and the kind of clients you work with, real estate, ag processing, facility design, legal review. These are things you do, Tom, business planning, strategy, engineering. And I guess that probably comes from your background. You mentioned earlier that you have MBAs uh, on your staff and it's people who are interested in those kinds of ways of delivering law practices and law law um services you also tell me more about patents that i mean that's really fascinating so patents you know kind of there's uh kind of our mission i guess backing up just a hair our mission is to help innovative businesses uh, grow strong legal foundations and part of that is you know we have a transaction you have your securities but then you have your patents and patent is one form of intellectual property in a patent. What a patent is in the U.S., every most countries in the world have some form of patents. And there are ways to, you know, expand a U.S. patent into an international protection situation and vice versa. Um, but what a patent does for you is it essentially says, hey, you came up with something unique and not obvious. It's something that no one has done before. And we think that society is better off having this new innovation and in return for you disclosing it to the public, we'll give you a 20 year monopoly on the concept itself. So a patent is essentially a 20 year monopoly on a concept and in return, disclose it to the public. So, you know, an innovator might come in and say, hey, I've, I've got this innovative way to do a new garage door or whatever whatever it might be. And, and we look at it and we do some searching and we say, Hey, that's a novel idea. It's not obvious in light of what exists currently. So we work with the USPTO and we go back and forth with the patent office and we say, Hey, uh, we think this is a unique idea. The examiner kind of goes back and forth, does their own searching. And at the end of the day, we put together a set of claims and that's your 20 year monopoly that you can use in your business. Nice. So there's patents pending. Does that just mean it takes a while for the whole thing to become legal? Is that what that means? Yeah. So the patent process is a slow process. Okay. So you apply for a patent. The United States Patent and Trademark Office, they don't even crack it open for probably 16 months. It, it gets there. It just kind of sits because they're busy and mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of a slow process, but they crack it open after 16 months and then they examine it. it might take another year after that. So during that stage where you apply and tell it grants, 
that's patent pending. So many products you see out there will have this label patent pending. And what that means is, hey, you've got something on file with the patent office. It's not necessarily granted, but there potentially are rights. So it puts the world on notice that, hey, if you rip this thing off, there might be problems in the future. Got it. And then, then does it go in order of who had the idea first, if there's something that's similar, if they're pending? Yeah, so... So there's a couple of new, it's very nuanced as to how that works exactly, but generally speaking, it's first to file. So whoever files the invention first, they get the right to the 20 year monopoly. But that said, let's say someone in, you know, China or the UK or where, somewhere in the world has come up with that idea and you apply for it a year later and they're using it in China. What they're using, somewhere else, it could be the US, wherever. What If they're using it in public prior to when you file that application, you can't say this was a novel idea. So you don't get the right to patent it if it's already in existence. Okay. That's so interesting. I, I'm a big fan of Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. Um, and he did a lot of research back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And he would say that everything starts with an idea. So and and back then, I, I heard it said that somebody said one time, hey, everything that's ever going to be invented already has. So we don't even really need patents anymore, which yeah. is hilarious when you think about what's happened yeah. since then. Yeah. But thinking about the idea that comes to you or us or anybody um, in, in the shower and you don't get out of the shower and do something with it. I've heard it said that that idea needs to be born somewhere. So we'll go somewhere where it can get brought into the world. So the moral of that story is if you have an idea that you think is unique, you should probably go talk to Tom and find out if you need to get that legal. Yeah. And every, you know, that's where a patent starts. A patent is, is a concept. You don't have to bring it to into existence per se. It's, it's just the concept you can go out and patent. So there's two pieces to a patent though. So it's, uh, from a pragmatic standpoint. So one, hey, I got a patent, I have this legal protection. But the second piece is, what are you going to do with it? Mm. And there are many avenues you can take. You can license it. You can, you know, manufacture and sell it yourself. You can do the process. You can, you know, maybe build a business around it and sell the business. There, there are many different avenues to take, but an idea in itself needs a lot of work to actually turn it into a business mm -hmm. and developing the business and developing the business model that's oftentimes just as difficult as getting the patent itself well the cool part about that with you you do both right yeah so we you know we do the patent side we also do the transactional set up the business help you you know have that strong foundation so that hey i got this great idea i want to grow this thing we we set that foundation up for you to grow and then, you know, there are a lot of, we try to point people in the right direction. There are a lot of different, you know, programs in town. There are SPDC and, you know, Generator and Score and all these different opportunities for, you know, people to go in and say, hey, I've got this, this idea. I want to, I want to grow this business. You can go get tons of advice from different sources and really kind of help you get your feet on the ground moving forward. So I, you know, Fargo, Fargo is a really good place to start a business just because there are so many resources for these early stage businesses. Yeah, that's a super great reminder for all of us. And um, by the way, this podcast goes beyond Fargo. So if you want to start a business, this might be a great place for you to look at moving to just saying. Yeah. So before you go to Shark Tank, talk to Tom, find somebody who can help you see whether you'll have uh, an opportunity to be heard by the sharks or be attacked by the sharks. Cause I watch shark tank too. So I know how that works. They're always talking about, well, we have a utility patent. Does that mean that you're using it before it's actually granted? So utility patent is typically what they're referring to is what's called a non-provisional application or a actually granted patent. There's design patents, which protect like the ornamental look mm. and there's utility patents, which protect the use itself. Oh, I see. Um, so it's basically, hey, I'm protecting a special use of something or a design or a composition of matter sort of thing. And utility patents are probably the most common. Shark Tank is, you know, I like Shark Tank. 
I used to kind of feel bad for the entrepreneurs giving up their business, but then I kind of came around and I'm like, well, actually, this is a really good opportunity for these people. And, you know, they're getting all these connections and they're, you know, they're getting an investment. But the bigger thing is just the connections and yeah. the, the roadmap to growth is just so great with those. Well, the funny thing about that, you're right. Um, I, I think even getting on Shark Tank, even if you don't get a deal, you still have to pay. You have to give up part of your business somehow to get there. And and yes, if you're looking at, I want it all myself, it is hard because you have to give up some of your equity. But if your idea is to change the world for the better, you know, that that's the best way to do it is to multiply your opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. And you need, you need connections, you need capital, you need a way to grow. And, yep. you know, sometimes a startup just doesn't quite have that capability and having that, that, uh, that connection is just huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you also, um, let's just talk about you for a second and then we'll kind of bring it home, but you are from, you know, around here, you're from Park Rapids. You went to the North Dakota state now, how did you do the NDSU UND thing? Because boy, that's tough in this part of the country. If you don't know, Fargo is where North Dakota State University is, and Grand Forks, an hour north, is where the University of North Dakota is, and they're big rivals. And you went to both. Yeah, and it, the actually NDSU and UND work a lot together. You know, behind the scenes, <laughs> there is a lot of field. sports rivalry, but yeah. you know, there's a lot of camaraderie. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Uh, so NDSU, yeah, it was just a really good fit. I looked, so I went to NDSU for engineering mm -hmm. and then I was looking at, you know, I kind of want to go to law school after this. I, you know, I always was passionate about, I like building things. That's kind of the engineering side. I like, you know, creating things, but that's also the law side. So you're with the law, you're engineering, you know, your business or your process or the relationships, the risk that goes into something. Um, so I, I thought law school was a really good fit and wanted to go to law school. So I was looking at a couple different schools and I looked at Colorado and I looked at Florida and, and it was so expensive, you know, Colorado is, it, it you know, quite a while ago. Um, but it was like 50,000 a year and UND was like 14,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just could not justify, you know, spending, you know, four times as much going to a location like Florida or Colorado mm -hmm. uh, when I could get it for for what UND was offering. Yeah. And UND is a good school too. You know, yeah, it, it definitely is a good school. They've got a great reputation for law and aviation, especially, and medicine. Um, so you actually then really pretty much dug into the state because as you then grew your business, you also have become a representative for our state legislatively yeah so i i did that for eight years and uh after i came back to fargo i got got into politics a little bit and i got elected to the state house and and uh, that was a really good experience helped me have some good perspective about kind of inner workings of government you know kind of how things work on that side which has been very valuable um and it was you know i really appreciated being able to put my two cents into how things ran and tried to, you know, help things move in the direction I thought was relevant. Uh, so that was a really good experience. Do you have any aspirations, bigger pol political aspirations? You know, at one point I thought maybe, but I, uh, I got kind of uh, burnt out from politics a little bit, kind of frustrated with it uh, mm. by the time I was done. And just, you know, I, I guess I, I enjoy running the business, staying out of the public eye. And, mm. you know, I, I guess I'm fine, fine with that. You know, yeah. I, I do, I do enjoy having my two cents put into the mix, but, you know, things are so divisive and mm -hmm. it's kind of nice staying out of it. So. Well, it's it's nice, especially when you're a, a business guy and an innovation guy, and you you really want to help people who have ideas bring them forward. And sometimes politics is just such a big machine that it gets things don't move as quickly as I bet you would want them to as an innovator. Oh, it's it's very slow and it's very you know 
political. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. you know, you know, one of the things as a business owner, I can move very quickly. If I think something's important to do or I want to, you know, work with someone specifically, I make it happen and I get it done. In government, it's a very slow process and you might see some big inefficiencies or things that you just say, this is way backwards. This doesn't make any sense that we do it this way. Mm-hmm. Um, I understand what, you know, whatever is the motivators, but it doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's very difficult to change. And well, it, the change of something that huge, this is always a horrible example, but the Titanic, you know, moves from the back, right? And it's a huge thing. And by the time the Titanic saw the iceberg, there was no hope because you have to turn from the back and it takes forever to turn that. So change is not a friend of big business or big government or big anything, really. Yep. Yep. So yeah. Do- and big, I'm small business too, you know, yeah. like you said, big business, it's, it's got its challenges and it's political in itself too, you know, or, you know, and people playing games and playing mm-hmm. the climb the ladder and all these different things. So, well, and that's the, the difference for me. And I, I have a small business too. I have obviously really, really small business. I'm a solopreneur. But one thing that's been really interesting to me lately is the distinction between traditional bureaucracy, which is the way we know things have always been, and a book that I discovered during the pandemic called Humanocracy. And that kind of shifts everything from the institution first to the individuals first. And I really like that shift. And it sounds to me like that's what you're doing with your small business. You're starting with individuals because you have in mind an impact you want to make with your own business, but also the clients and customers your business can serve. And I really like that because that's what the future needs, in my opinion, more human democracy. Yeah, I I think that people are so important. One of the things I've been pretty good at is figuring out what the strengths of people are and figuring out ways to delegate them responsibility and uh, position them in a way that, you know, that fits their skill set. And I think I've been successful at that. And that's one thing I've been pretty good at over the years. So, you know, it starts with, hey, we've got the vision this and the mission. This is where the this is where the business is, the direction it's gone. This is the kind of the broad model. Now, how do we plug in the people that really want to be there and really fit and really have the skill set to do it and you know and build upon their skills and you know go because we have our vision you know we have the direction we're going you know the exact methodology of how do we get there really is dependent on the people and you know building building the people up to make it happen I love that. I love that. Um, so Tom, if people wanted to get a hold of you either as maybe they want to work for you at some point or um, looking for their own attorney, how would they get a hold of you? So feel free to reach out anytime. My email, Tom at Fargo patent law.com. Um, feel free to give us a call too, but we're on social media. The two big sites we're on LinkedIn, we're heavy on LinkedIn okay. and then also on Facebook. Okay. Anything else, Tom, you'd like to share? Anything else? No, I um, enjoy, enjoy the conversation. And I you know I think it's been fun to kind of grow in the community and grow with different small business owners like yourself and just kind of, you know, it'll be a fun couple of years to see how all these different businesses come together. So Sounds good. Well, thank you so much for being with me, Tom. And as always, everybody reach out to Tom and get real. Talk to you again. Bye.